Okay. Hello. Hi. I'm recording. We're back. We're back. We're back. It's the birthday of Dasha. It's my birthday. 17 years old. We're doing. <laughs> Everyone's making that joke. I yeah, love it. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, we're doing a special. I'm doing my favorite thing on my special day, which is podcasting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I like working on my birthday, actually yeah usually because if you don't you just get besieged by melancholic exactly. thoughts I, it's mortality. already too late for me yeah i've already blown it i like have succumbed to to dark dosh <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> dark universe stuff. but i'll re- i'll i'll bounce back but yeah birthday is kind of a drag got a bit of the birthday blues to be honest why is that why do you feel mel i'll psychoanalyze you you know it's not like the aging thing it's just like evaluating where you're at in your life and like i mean objectively i'm in a good place in my life yeah i don't know by most people's metrics nostalgia is poison it's just it's too you think about yourself too much on your birthday yeah and in general (laughs) yeah that's my problem well and you you inevitably like i told my shrink today um have to come to terms with your mortality and mediocrity that you are just a speckle of dust on the face of the earth as we all are yeah which is sad well i'm getting a lot of attention so that yeah that's great that's well, that helping. offsets it. well you want to set yourself up in Too a position much attention, honestly. you think it's yeah. a little it's a little it's a little excessive making me full full of dread that's also awful when like yeah people are like hitting you up on your birthday and you have to like um respond to everybody Emotional individual labor yeah <laughs> wow 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 yeah no it's Poor good. Me. it's yeah it's nice to turn 29 and be like at a good place in your life yeah it's a I'll great feeling yeah and 19 is kind of hot the same way that like 19 is hot wait 19 like being 19 oh yeah you know yeah because you're like right on the cusp of something yeah it's like the last year of your teens yeah and 29 also has like a similar energy i think yeah it has kind of like this um you're like fully resplendent in bloom entering your womanhood i'm in the summer of my life yeah i think rotting from the core (laughs) um no i mean it's like not bad i I prefer being in my thirties to being in my twenties in a weird way. I mean, maybe that's like a huge rationalization or a cope as they say, but it doesn't feel bad. People say when you turn 30, you stop caring about all the stuff you cared about in your twenties. This is true. No, it's absolutely true. Like you really just like all the fucking kind yeah. of You're low, like, like all the low grade vanity, all the body dysmorphia, all the like little torturous things that you do to yourself fall away. Kupo told me when we were at that fabulous boat party Mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, when he turned 30, he was like, this is it. I'm not getting any like smarter, any hotter, any like, you don't have to like strive as much because you're sort of like, this is, this is 30. Yeah. And people accept you as a kind of like elder statesman of cocaine abuse. The respect. Yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling, I'm feeling respected, which is nice. And we'll get respected at dinner later too. Oh yeah. We, I was told by a friend of the pod, Maddie, that we would be treated like celebs. Yeah. I was like, honey, we are celebs. Just kidding. At a Keith McNally restaurant. Yeah. I have no idea. I don't know anything about these celebrity micro chefs. I guess they're not a chef. He's a restaurateur. Okay. And you know, see, did you know that Keith McNally didn't eat at a restaurant until he was 17 years old? That's isn't that inspiring? Yeah. W- w- <laughs> what did he grow up on a farm? He was like working class. Okay. He was like poor, and now he's one of the most celebrated restaurateurs in New York City. Mm-hmm. Balthazar, mm-hmm. Minetta Tavern, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Keith. It's a pri- it's a paywalled one, but um, I'll let him know I sang his praises. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Oh, did you read my interview magazine? <laughs> I did. I Let's loved it. Let's talk about me. Somewhere. Let's talk about you, Dasha. Today is your your day. Um, um, I don't like being called a socialist socialite. It's just corny, but that's but you know it's the media okay. has to. No matter what you do, they'll always 
come up with like a little. She did a great job. She did a Karina wonderful job. A wonder- very pleased with her journalism. The um the questions are really good. They were questions that Andy Warhol asked Glenn O'Brien. Oh, okay. when he was running Interview Magazine. I see. I see. Okay. So that's why they kind of had a fun arty energy yeah kind of like dark panache that's why i said i'm catholic like andy warhol which seemed like a non sequitur but i was like you you know Uh, referencing interview magazine i see (laughs) interesting um what's this thing wait i have i like storied it i hope the story hasn't expired i like this thing that you said about um remaining vigilant remaining vigilant and taking responsibility for your desires and you say that a lot of people would be better off if they could do that which is actually kind of like the central premise of this podcast if you think about it um Mm. when people accuse us of like fat shaming and victim blaming all we're saying is take responsibility for your lot in life instead of complaining about that's right what you are or how you're treated up by your parents (laughs) i'm a big proponent of the neoliberal the neoliberal ethos of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps in your own pri- in your own private life psychologically yeah once it becomes a, a question of like political subjecthood then it becomes like a really evil doctrine mm-hmm. and right. that's what people confuse right right but i think you should you should strive to be kind of like the most emotionally kind of airtight and hottest you can be at all times <laughs> you should not leak upon your friends you can be a little crazy a little bit, sometimes. Yeah. Selectively. As a, as a tree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, you just have some self-respect. Yeah, but that's that what's... a concise way of putting it. But also. that's what's lacking in our culture, I think, is is this kind of broad notion of self-respect. Yeah. I know you don't... Did Joan Didion wrote a great essay about... No, I like Didion. I mean, I like her as, as an, a, a role model, like an exemplary role model of like dignity and self-respect. A moralist, yeah. Yeah, she was imperious. Yes. Which I like. I like kind of imperious, imperious grandeur in a woman. She says self-respect is the bedrock of, um, of character. It is. Mm-hmm. It's all we've got. And people don't have character these days. They don't. <clears throat> Unfortunately. I think I looked at, I, I was like looking at like the girls in gay sub. I probably shouldn't disclose that i should we all know that we look we we post on the reddit anna (laughs) i know we like chime in on like i know but i don't want to rub it in um but somebody said we shouldn't i know it's not good for me no it's not it's it's actually kind of undignified and lacking in self-respect but people are hurting me (laughs) (laughs) um but somebody said that um you in that interview reminded them of like an old countercultural figure that's like from sweet. from the heyday of the counterculture yeah and i was like wow that's like novel and true but it's brought into sharp relief by the fact that there are literally no dignified self-respecting role models for us to look up to right that's why we had to step on to the <laughs> yeah who else i mean who is there maybe the french actresses because they don't speak english so you can't tell how undignified they are yeah and yeah and they don't talk about themselves typically yeah like brie larson anne hathaway chrissy teigen <laughs> god chrissy teigen yeah, yeah that's like that's what we've got in the celebrity stock down down Celeb- yeah. celebrities way down sell <laughs> sell celebrity by um privacy <laughs> <laughs> yeah no seriously it's like um what's that fucking corny ass joke that like um you know warhol said that everybody would have their 15 minutes of fame and now we're at the stage where everybody is like we'll have their 15 minutes of privacy <laughs> remember <laughs> this is a warhol themed yeah episode I, i'm a fan what's um, his sign Ooh, gemini that's Maybe. a guess let's, let's can you look it up my yeah. phone's charging well i said that i said the thing about staying vigilant and taking responsibility for your desires in the context of like romantic advice, mm-hmm. which I think is kind of the best advice I've ever given. Yeah. <laughs> Not to pat myself on the back. Do you, do you care to unpack that while I look up Andy Warhol? Yes. I think the, what I meant by vigilance is like sort of has two facets, which is like first, when you first meet someone, you have to like guard against totally letting someone like crush you. Mm hmm. And 
always keep your walls up. That's what I'm saying, people. <laughs> no, but you have to like, because I think when people fall in love, they end up just sort of replicating their like familial dynamics that they had with their parents Mm -hmm. and then like infantilizing themselves and then that relationship becomes immediately unsustainable because Because you become roommates yeah or like parents and anything that like deviates from like a kind of familial love becomes unacceptable and you don't have room to like be your own person yeah and you like start to resent exactly the other person and similarly when you're in a you know comfortable semi-stable relationship i think you have to remain vigilant to like be interesting for another person right and stimulating and like both intellectually and sexually yeah exactly um andy warhol's a leo by the way august 6th which makes sense i guess um yeah that's cute (laughs) yeah i had i mean i had this crazy not to make it about me now no since it's your birthday i had a really (laughs) crazy breakthrough in a therapy therapy today um where my shrink was like uh you don't live with this man Mm. and also you don't use contraception yeah and well condoms are gross yeah they're gross and also who in a in a this is like you know off topic but it's like crazy who in a monogamous relationship or to my knowledge monogamous uses contraception well birth control well yeah uh, well yeah but who uses condoms kind of sick freaks use condoms in a relationship <laughs> what kind of sick freaks use condoms in general man i'm really, honestly I, I really question the kind of like um <clears throat> central tenet of uh-huh. liberal enlightened thinking that that safe sex is uh, good or admirable uh-huh. that it's some, a goal to strive toward no such thing as safe sex yeah your sex know. should be unsafe if you're not having unsafe sex are you even having sex <laughs> it should be physically and morally and spiritually risky. I think it doesn't count to use a condom because the you know, he's not technically touching the inner walls, right? So you're ba- basically so not, not having sex. sex. You're basically having lesbian sex. <laughs> Sorry, Moira Donigan. <laughs> right. Um, I no, have this... raise the stakes. That's another piece of advice I'd like to give you people. Yeah, that's it's a great. Like, raise the stakes. Live with it make your own life worth living Mm -hmm. inject meaning into your own life this is a very inspirational episode of thoughts but i had this psychotic breakthrough that i was like oh well you know i'm thinking of having a kid with eli and the the shrink was like well you don't live together and you don't do this and you don't do that and then it dawned what does that have to do with anything because he's i think he's a very nice by the book guy and he's talking about the traditional kind of like benchmark right 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 that people have when they like agree to cohabitate and procreate and i thought like god damn i'm replicating my parents marriage and relationship because my parents did not live together until they moved to the the united states when they had to forcibly live together wow my mom was had two children in russia Mm -hmm. and lived you know, in her parents' quartiera, my dad lived in his parents' quartiera or in a yeah. adjacent one. Well, that's how Soviet housing. It was very, that's also a you know a feature yeah. of Soviet housing. Well, yeah, and then I had this kind of galaxy brain realization that the Soviet Union created such a war, such an assault on the family. Well, yeah, that was the idea. Yeah, that's I mean, it is ideology. Yeah. And then you have two dueling systems one which directly went to war with another actually vice versa they were like locked in a rivalry Uh and capitalism as we know ended up winning and the outcome is still the same the destruction of the of the family atomization alienation erosion yeah we'll get yeah the only difference is that you know soviet society was at least kind of putatively um involved in the collective mission of building a new society right envisioning kind of a a new society in in futuristic terms and Um, now we're simply a society in decay yeah we're just replicating the worker as this one of this pair of essays that we're going to talk about today says wow so yeah your traumas demand to be repeated yeah but it's really crazy like they demand to be repeated in physical form like in in a literal manifestation and that's why we talk about vigilance (laughs) you can't become your parents you can't (laughs) become someone's baby Mm -hmm. 
if you want. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm not married, so well, yeah. I'm probably not qualified to, to give be, advice to or give, to be married. To give advice. I am or be married maybe, but <laughs> do you even want to be married? Mm-hmm. You do. Okay. And what I said in that interview about marriage having a kind of romantic pragmatism Mm -hmm. was actually informed by my experience of doing this podcast with you, Anna, Mm -hmm. because I feel like we're in a kind of marriage in a sexless marriage. (laughs) (laughs) I guess we are. You know, we have this like mutual vest, like venture that we're invested in. Uh Right. We have the incentive, both financial and creative to like keep it going. Not that we would fight anyway. Like we get along, we have a good relationship, but I think that having something, you know, we see each other basically only to do the pod, mm-hmm. which is nice because mm-hmm. we like save up all our good material for one yeah. another. Yeah. Um, and in that, like, I could see a marriage functioning in a similar way successfully also. Yeah. I mean, you have to, I mean, look, you have to like think about it and like, what you I'm have to be. Is, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> will you marry me, Dasha? <laughs> um, you have to be like, yeah, you have to make a, a an almost pragmatic calculation and say, um, you know, love, partnership is work. Everything is work. Mm-hmm. A marriage is it's work. Is work. People people are surprised when their marriages fall apart because they haven't really worked at them. Because the wife immediately starts wearing sweatpants and the husband recedes to his man cave or whatever, and it's all downhill from there. Yeah, and then before you know it, he's like fucking his neighbor. Uh, there's a, a woman, a very attractive, tall, thin woman who walks around naked Where? Out in the apartment across from Eli's apartment. Wow. And I was just, we were sitting there like watching this woman. Hot. Weird. And I was like, is she, is, that's an exhibitionist, right? Yeah. I bet there's a higher um, uh, rate of exhibitionism among young, attractive women. than Definitely. Yeah. Like yeah. they get, all, but like she was just like languidly. Well, I think it's hot, attractive women and then like disgusting. Dirty men. old men who look like Welbeck and have deformed penises. Right. He's never going to come have, on the pod now. Fuck. I think we didn't say he had a deformed <laughs> penis. but <laughs> It's shaped like a, a circle of brie cheese, a wheel, a brie wheel. <laughs> it's, yeah. And it's got like white crust. <laughs> oozing well i read that the thing with like flashing with male exhibitionism is like castration anxiety yeah you like like, will have to show your horrible penis to someone to like justify that it's still there when the shock registers on their face speckled ginger penis or you're just a hot woman who takes pleasure in the thought of other people taking pleasure in viewing her body right women watch themselves be watched which seems to be men. slightly more honorable than being a dirty old man men who, show their dicks to, <laughs> to <laughs> unsuspecting <laughs> children <laughs> did you ever get flashed when you were a kid oh like all the time yeah I'm i grew up in new jersey just constantly not safe las vegas too not yeah. safe out there the I, suburbs are crawling with <laughs> pedophiles. pedophiles yeah they really were i mean like I remember kind of that like sticky, sweet feeling of like summer and there was always like pedophiles in the bushes <laughs> doing their little pedophile jig. It's so scary to see a penis when you're a kid. I know. It's really an effective way to spook a spook a little girl. I know. I yeah. I have a very yeah, I remember once like <laughs> I don't I'm not going to therapy, so you're my therapist. Yeah. But like a man like pulling up to me and my friend Lucy, I was probably in like fourth grade or third. What's that like eight, ten? Eight, yeah. Okay. And he said, "Do you want to see my penis?" And I like didn't hear him correctly, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and then he said he like muttered it again, and then I like slowly perceived that he was jacking off. You know. Wait, where? In his, <laughs> in his car. In his car. But where were you outside uh, of the car? So, yeah, I was like outside of the car. And where's the other? girl was we were both okay. outside the car no no neither of us got in the car and then i remember ru- ru- just like we ran away mm-hmm. and i was wearing clogs and i remember like the feeling of running in clogs and being like <laughs> it feeling like treacherous and like metaphor scary yeah like weighed down by the exactly. heavy wooden heels <laughs> of life <laughs> exactly precarious i think like 
the thing i think new jersey and las vegas being kind of alternate world versions of each other Mm -hmm. are hotbeds for pedophiles like weird transient thoroughfares it's like you know afghanistan is the graveyard of civilizations and and new jersey or las vegas is a similar thoroughfare for pedophiles so though i'm pretty sure there's tons of pedophiles in afghanistan too because that's sin city yeah um but i also think like i don't know if this is an experience common to all little little girls and i suspect that both you and I projected a certain type of energy. No, I mean, it's true. I not, no, come on, but like, I know a certain like weird abject bottomless need for attention that you like project something about that girl that makes me want to traumatize her. Yeah. (laughs) She seems to be wanting it more than these other girls. Yeah, no, I mean, and I remember being like a kid and my dad always had like visiting friends who were like these kind of intellectual young men in like turtlenecks Mm -hmm. or like Slavo Zizek style, uh, splayed open shirt mathematicians. (laughs) And I always remember like the weird, creepy sexual transference that happened between you and them, me and them. Yeah. In a way that I'm pretty sure did not happen with my sister, you know, because she didn't put it out there. Right she wasn't precocious yeah in the same way yeah maybe it's a it's a very interesting thing to think about because it exists and it like again flies in the face of this like legalese affirmative consent society that we've built up where everybody has to be protected right from sexual menace and danger (laughs) because it doesn't work that way in the real world no no such thing as safe sex yeah and that's the thing we're not making a moral judgment we're not saying like um it's good or bad if x happens to you we're saying x will will in all likelihood (laughs) happen to you and it's delusional to think otherwise to guard against it. yeah damn yep you will turn 29 (laughs) you will yeah do you have um do you have like a weird superstition with odd versus even years or not really no, I'm not autistic. OCD. Yeah. Uh, no, I like the number nine is kind of a nice one mm-hmm. to me, but I don't have any real reason. My birthday, it's the 19th. I don't know. There's something with nines that, that's, yeah, that's yeah. hot to me. Yeah. It's the last one. Yeah. <laughs> the edge. Real, real, the yeah, cliff. edge. That's what I'm talking about. That's <laughs> what it is. It's like edges, liminal spaces. This is what desire the space between things the space between your 20s and your 30s mm-hmm. 29 um real genius stuff to yeah <laughs> i wonder if people are gonna like or hate this um like these girls are on fire or these girls are retarded they're gonna, they're, gonna call, they're gonna call me a narcissist but are we okay. doing the unboxing yeah should i sorry um, I just no it's started. fine and i got me some presents yeah i got the pr- i got some prez so we're gonna kill some time um I, I went to Do a little ASMR for yeah people. oh yeah Unra- unwrapping unwrapping my birthday present <laughs> ASMR <laughs> I I walked by um, papyrus and saw it was going out of business what's papyrus it's a stationery and gift oh, wrap I love store that. and then I went to paper Ooh. source which is fancier and more expensive because only the best for Dasha um. And I got me some Winky Lux brand strobing balm. Yeah. Is that, that like blush? Um, It's like highlighter. I love But you it. can use it as blush. You can do like the dab on the nose and the Cupid's bow. We love that. Exactly. Perfect. I need a new freck, um, freck, freckle, freckle pen. pen. I lost one. <laughs> <laughs> I cried all my freckle freckles off. And this is um, a lip gloss in um, truffle. Mm-hmm. thanks anna um ladies if you want a uh higher end but not break the bank the bank <laughs> style makeup line winky looks so it's yeah. really good it's really high I quality used any of their products i ooh, i like have so many products me too it's really horrible it's i purge everyone do you go oil. to space nk yeah apothecary london yeah that's like that store i was in there the other day and they had um, 
<laughs> they had like if you spent like three hundred dollars or something you got like a bag with like lots of more products in it and i was like oh my god i was like wow and so i was like trying to spend that money but i like already have everything, everything yeah. you know so i like and the lady was literally like she's like well if you want something new and i realized that the women who shop at space nk are like they have it's all it's like kind of for older women with facelifts yeah yeah or and surgical it's like, threads it's what happens when you have so much disposable income that you just want like the novelty of purchasing like, right of something you that's it, gonna do something yeah you just Some you can experiment oil. you can yeah. afford to experiment it's not like a holy grail product store i can't believe i use that <laughs> phrase what a disgusting <laughs> hate branding jargon yeah um it's like to buy like some hyper specific yeah. thing that they like just made up yeah, that actually does nothing really. It's like a skincare line from the Springs of Budapest or the Alps. And my, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The mountains. Some kind of like, yeah. yeah, Swiss ass branding. They're so Doctor I, vaguely like medical jargon. Yeah, I mean, don't exactly like um, Doctor Roth or Doctor Grossman. Or I like Dr. the Korean whatever. products because they they just go full like made up like sleep talks. Like if you put this on, the toxins will like <laughs> water, moisture, hydro essence. It's just like totally like a free for all. It's like branding <laughs> word salad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's also kind of ESL. Yeah, Mo- moist. Place huh? ampule on fresh skin. <laughs> moist touch youth barrier created by <laughs> <laughs> and also i know that we just did grass skin. did a bad thing but those products are so inherently like racist and sexist like it's always it like your skin yeah it's like white white aholic i had a moisturizer called white aholic i don't know why i bought it i like the packaging and also i was in mainland china and i was like i'm not a white aholic i don't want my skin to be lighter I had like a Michael Jackson, like pallorous gray cast. I was yeah. like walking around looking like I was going to dangle a baby from a balcony. White all. <laughs> and then there's one that I to they go to s- rehab for. I know. For whiteness. There's, I'm going to like Sammy Sosa myself if that's even possible. Um, <laughs> but like there, there was like a product that was like virgin pussy balm or something. <laughs> It's yeah, like, I'm sure that's look like one of Epstein's victims. Look, yeah. With this face Put mask. Put it on your pussy. Oh my god, Anna. What? You got me a silk pillowcase? Not one, but but two, bitch. Wow. Yeah. That's so nice. I love this. Thank you. I wanted a silk pillowcase. I know, and it's something that people would never ever buy for themselves. I bought I just bought myself a, a silk sleep mask. Oh, an eye mask, yeah. But yeah, but then I was like I'm not going to spring for the pillows, but Anna this is going to change everything. Yeah. Do you yeah. sleep on silk pillows? I I have in the past, but I'm, mine got ruined in the wash. I have to like reinvest. Oh yeah. How do you, you can't wash them, right? I think you can. I'm going to make Eli buy me some silk face masks because it's wrong to, or uh, pillowcases because it's wrong to um, buy them yourself, I think. Oh my God. No more anti-sleep crease, anti-bedhead, anti-aging. <laughs> anti-racism, anti-fascist. This is going to change everything. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, of course. You went to Bloomies. I went to Bloomies. Love it there. Um, oh, that's great. Thanks so much. Very thoughtful. Very thoughtful gifts. Maddie got me boxing gloves, um, which is very it's beautiful. Sweet of her too. It's like metaphoric, yeah. Yeah. I look so frail with the boxing yeah. gloves on. That's what I. That's what I like. <laughs> them. And I'll like put them in my room, and then when guys come over, I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I guess I'm like I'm gonna beat. I you box up. like a model. <laughs> 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 I'm athletic. <laughs> I'm Contrary dexterous. What my haters say, and flexible. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Should we talk about these articles? Yeah. How long have we been yapping? God, like thirty probably, minutes. Wow. Well, we can talk about this birthday is really like talks about itself flying by yeah. <laughs> yeah i said we should do a pot on my birthday to give me not only give me purpose but to please the fans yeah um and i was like we could probably fill a bunch of time i know just talking about how it's my special day and i was like what's wrong with you you dumb bitch mm. you want to work on your birthday 
but it worked out it worked out well um uh, so jacobin jacobin published an article do you remember what this article is called because i don't know it was some it was about pornography it had a long title um oh capitalism killed intimacy and replaced it with Pornhub. yes Oh, Jacobin is really kind of like at the cutting edge of stating the obvious. <laughs> it was very um, banal, I'd say. It was the most self-explanatory article I've ever read. It was like, yeah, they just explained like alienation. Yeah, which and is ASMR. A Marxist concept. Yeah, it did a little, it conflated um, ASMR with pornography a little too much for me, I think. Yeah, I don't think they serve the same. No, but I, the, the the idea that yeah they approximate some kind of intimacy. Intimacy, yeah. Um, but do you experience ASMR sensations? Um, I have. Yeah, I remember experiencing. Um, since we're getting like really nostalgic, I remember during school photo day when they would comb your hair. Yeah, I you that was that. when I first experienced ASMR because my parents never touched me or told me they loved me <laughs> unless it was to, like beat my ass, like whoop my ass. I was like, oh my god, oh, these nice fat little ladies. Anna. I know, um, getting her hair brushed, getting yeah. her mullet brushed for school. Picture yeah, <laughs> it was like. I just picture us as babies, like um, the same that we are now. Yeah, but, like, like scaled like down Muppet to babies. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> um. You're That's just like, nice. but you don't watch ASMR videos. No, sure. I was They're born with weird these tits, <laughs> <laughs> eight months old, <laughs> dragging myself by my tits. Anyway, <laughs> no, I don't. Do you? No, no. Do you, I think a lot of people experience this podcast as a parasocial phenomenon, but also probably as ASMR. People have told me they've exp- they like the sound of our voices, um, <sighs> or like lip smacking. One guy said um, that. The sound of my voice helped him with heroin withdrawals. Wow, which was, which was nice, amazing. <laughs> Personally, I don't, I don't see what the big deal is, but <laughs> about heroin withdrawals, no, <laughs> about my voice. Um, no, ASMR videos are weird. I don't, I, don't I just like can't them. imagine devoting that much time to, like, Feel- sustaining that much interest in a mundane. Well, I think if the sensations are intense, it's not mundane. It's quite pleasurable. I see. People do it to feel good. I see. Um, I had a philosophy professor in college, Mm -hmm. Professor Gupta, who was an Indian guy, Mm -hmm. and he would stroke his beard when he talked, Mm -hmm. and the sound of his voice was very soothing to me, and I took a lot of his classes. Mm -hmm. And when I learned about ASMR, I was like, oh. That's what that is, yeah. Yeah. and I once read ASMR for dummies because I was doing some like art project where I had to do ASMR stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, and for someone else, I'm not, you know, a <laughs> performance artist. Uh, and I read ASMR for dummies. Mm-hmm. And there was a chapter about how um, if you are the kind of person who triggers ASMR sensations in people, mm-hmm. you have to be very careful, mm-hmm. vigilant, mm-hmm. or they'll fall in love with fall in love with you. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Is it advised like keeping your hands in your pockets and not like tapping your fingernails around someone who's sense who's touched and sensitive to the Well, wouldn't the type of person who triggered an ASMR response differ from person to person? I think specific people can can be tri- can be triggers. Hmm. I think like whispering is obviously the big one, but I think there's a lot about like people's voices and auras or something Mm -hmm. i don't know (laughs) i'm trying to think if i know of anybody who triggers an asmr response in me i don't know i've got nothing yeah i've got really lonely yeah it's lonely at the top so the thesis of this essay was basically the title Mm -hmm. that we've we live in like a spiritually depleted world you don't say where (laughs) Um, everything's atomized and it's pretty, you know, we were really reaching for something to read. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be more about, um, you know, in Jacobin, I thought it would go more into sort of like the labor dynamics in the pornography industry. Right. That would have been maybe, um, a good take. 
I like, I mean, I like Jacobin. They're doing an important service. A friend of mine said that they only read Jacobin in the Daily Mail and it's made them way smarter. Really? Yeah. Um, Which I can see, but it's just like the kind of, uh, the kind of like self-explanatory, like eighth grade exposition style, which is always bookended by, but we must fight. We must fight to regain (laughs) X. We must unionize intimacy. What's the prescription here? actually Um, besides fighting she says that we must fight to regain intimacy okay um get out there and touch your friends (laughs) yeah and i'm like whisper in their ears what is how do you fight to regain intimacy and build like you just have like normal relationships with your friends and your lovers sorry i use that word but intimacy is horrifying also yeah and there's like certain what does she say i like to screen cap this i'm really hungover so uh not the best interpreter today um there's like uh she like literally explains asmr yeah uh she talks about like the the light smacking of the lips when somebody whispers a scratch of a pencil and paper the sound of hair being combed sounds and some that we're only used to that we're only used to hearing when in close proximity to another human being Mm -hmm. like does this need to be stated (laughs) whispering and physical tenderness are uncommon modes of interaction between strangers in our society as they should I was like, that's be. good that's yeah. good i'm not gonna like sensuously whisper in a stranger's <laughs> ear it was a little like, yeah on the train like, excuse me can you move over oh oh sorry excuse uh, me you're blocking the accent excuse me mind if i fit you for a suit <laughs> <laughs> can i brush your hair like gently caressing somebody's hair on the train. <laughs> <laughs> what? I mean, really, we should. Pornography should be illegal. I think. Pornography. Yeah. I think we should criminalize abortion pornography. and pornography should be illegal. That's Here how you rebuild go. a healthy society. That's right. If people are saddled with, with infants, <laughs> they'll be they're <laughs> unable to get their let out. You want intimacy. Through a screen. Get fucking pregnant. Yeah, that's real intimacy. That's the most a person can ever be inside you. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh. Sorry. No, it's fine. I was reading it's about beautiful. how, like, it's cool. um, pregnancy makes your tits saggy. It makes your hips wider. Makes your hair fall out. What? Makes well, your hair fall out? I thought you were supposed... I thought the perks were that you're, like... Well, you overproduce estrogen during your pregnancy so it makes your hair really thick and lustrous and your skin glow but then once you pass the stone i.e give birth to the baby three months into it your hair your hair like resumes its normal shedding cycle so you start to lose your hair but it goes back to normal it comes back eventually but you know we're talking about months of like uh you're already fat and ugly because you just gave birth (laughs) to a baby Oh you God. get stretch marks. I the scariest thing that I read was that um you're trying to get pregnant and you just looked up. Uh, yeah, no, literally. <laughs> you're like the baby's inside. Yeah, like, what? I have to do what? I thought it was an incub in an incubator. Um, I'm not rich enough to get a surrogate. Like Would you Beyonce. do a cesarean? I mean, may as well. Mm. I'm already doomed. <laughs> You already right. you you already have to like part with your um girlish figure that you've uh, whittled down over the years through uh intense exercise and calorie restriction and you know it's going to happen inevitably. Yeah. The scariest thing that I read was that your rib cage actually expands no. to accommodate the child and sometimes does not go back. So oh. you can't so even if you like eat or diet yourself down to size 0 again, you may never be able to like zipper certain dresses that's terrible i know i've spent so much money on clothing only to not wear it again oh i'm excited for your maternity fits yeah we shouldn't you're not even supposed to talk about. yeah i'm not gonna jinx it being pregnant (laughs) it's gay and retarded um but i can't wait to no but the rib thing really got me upset and made me second guess the whole process because then i was like this is my problem area I'm You're. shaped like a day laborer, which I go through so much <laughs> trouble to hide. No, I know true. I'm kidding. I'm being hyperbolic, but like. You have a very small frame. Yeah, but with a relatively wide rib cage. I'm not a size 28 bra band, that's for sure. 28 inches, I mean. Right. Yeah. I do think we would be better off if we 
criminalized pornography <laughs> yeah why or, like, because you think that it's like really kind of uh uh because we would still have pornography right or maybe but it would be a higher stakes game you're talking about making making it go back into the black market oops sorry sister mm. yeah um and maybe it's it's criminalized right it's not illegal right so like people can produce and like consume you, it but, but at a penalty if caught um no we just don't make it like widely available i see to you know we ha- we do we get rid of Pornhub and stuff bernie should really give you a post in the new admin online pornography you can iron this out you i can think, work with a, a team of economists you know, people aren't gonna, social scientists people don't like to hear it but like they would be better off people would be better off with if they weren't constraints constantly yeah like exposed to and having ac- had access to like, h- like hardcore internet pornography yeah i don't think that's crazy no i know i had this this convo with my shrink today too where where he was like well why do you think that you um living kind of a narcissistic life of, of self-fulfillment is unhealthy or corrosive I'm like, well, because inevitably you're going to wake up 50 years old, like barren and childless, childless and scream into the void yeah. because you're going to realize that you mismanaged your life because you don't realize it now while you're still like young or youngish, but you right. don't know what your future needs and desires will be. I think not. And I think not having children is like catastrophic for women. Yes, it is. It, inevitably it is. Whenever there's some like shrieking like <laughs> libtarded shrew yeah <laughs> that i like look into i'm like oh you're childless of course that's why you're have uh posting disease <laughs> mm-hmm. well just because you feel like um instant gratification from being kind of like uh popular and skinny and doing drugs and whatever hanging out with your friends like having sex with random guys doesn't mean that it's good for you right people do really need constraint people don't realize it's like you know pornography is like too much sugar yeah or too much alcohol it's not as i like to say it's not spring break (laughs) (laughs) that's what i'm gonna say to my kids who are gonna hate me (laughs) i i agree with you 100 percent I people don't know what's good for them and they don't know what they and want. And it's not pornography. It's not pornography. And pornography is also like, let's be real, really horrible for the women who do it. The men kind of like net out being like used car salesmen or like poker dealers in Vegas. The women well, of course. And all it's, die. It's not as if it's regulated anyway, right? Like there's, you hear all the time about like there being videos circulating on Pornhub of like literally like 16 year old right. girls getting raped and stuff. Yeah. And you're like, you can't distinguish actual like snuff film basically from a lot of pornography that's made anyway right you know especially that that russian stuff right exactly it's like you're like that i they seem like they're raping this girl (laughs) yeah and (laughs) And no one's gonna go to czechoslovakia to look into it you had to yeah you know some dungeon in prague but even when you have a kind of formalized heavily regulated industry um with maybe even like some sort of union representation and mandatory health checks which they have in the in the u.s in the in the pornography industry Industry. but like and even barring some crazy outliers like occasionally an hiv outbreak um mm -hmm. runs through the porn world and everybody goes into high alert and issues a bunch of kind of qualifying statements that actually um pornography porn workers are are much cleaner than the average than like yeah. the population at large right. because they're subjected to these routine std tests and you're like okay i believe that statistic but try being a woman who gets like eight cocks shoved up her ass for work <laughs> there's no way that that's healthy or good or meaningful or fulfilling work and if the the hordes of sex workers who were mad at me like three months ago want to get mad at me again so be it but there's no way that having sex on screen is good for right. women sure <laughs> i mean i think that there's maybe a small fraction of like women for whom i don't know like i believe riley reed is fulfilled by her work mm, no maybe maybe they've convinced i themselves. think like there's like a one percent of like people who are truly suited for it yeah who, like are 
porn. That's why they are porn stars, right? You know, no, that's true. Because but the vast they, like majority, like Sasha Gray, for example, you know, I and those think. are the women that overwhelmingly, I think, become masters of their own empire. Yeah, like it is. It is like liberal feminism, where you have like outliers, like Taylor Swift or Gloria Allred, who succeed under the system by taking eight cocks. No, but. <laughs> But the vast majority of women, are, I think, are probably like who go into porn are like coerced or cornered or something. Exactly, it's like it's pretty criminal what is happening in pornography and how. And if people didn't have access to it, um, or if it was like, you know, if we did, because there would still be porn. It's like with the argument about abortions, right? Like mm-hmm. it's like you can outlaw abortions, but people will still do them. Like. Mm-hmm we'll still have porn but we just have to be well we like you have to put time into fulfilling your desires Mm -hmm. which will only benefit you in the long run too because then you have to really reckon with what it is that you want and like you'll be that much more fulfilled when you get it you know how bad do you think porn has been in let's say shifting or, or determining people's libidinal desires i think extremely in in informative and instrumental in people's i think yeah the way that young people have sex is like hook up hot shot style i think yeah but then i struggle to like articulate what the meaningful difference is because it's not like people weren't beating each other up and spitting into each other's mouths and eating ass in of our course. grandparents generation right of course um but there's a performative aspect to it i mean you've i don't know haven't you ever been having sex with someone and you both like I've had sex with people where I'm like, oh, like we watch the same porn Mm -hmm. and we're like playing out this like. That's so scary. (laughs) Have that that moment of realization. Like we're doing the, we know exactly how to do this, even though we don't know each other that well. Yeah. I've never thought about it that way. That's really more of the thing is it's like back in the day, people were spitting in each other's mouths in like the context of like maybe knowing, having meaningful knowledge about your partner. Or and now it's kind of having like, well having a meaningful journey of like legitimate erotic discovery sorry that sounds really gay but being so like gay. oh my god we like the same thing right i like stringing women up by their legs you like being strung up <laughs> true love is like the equilibrium of um one person like when you like to take the abuse that another person likes to dish or vice versa beautiful it's true mm-hmm. um <laughs> no it's interesting well i was thinking about this this fucking scary this is paywalled so i'll tell a personal story um the reason i got together with eli is because he a mutual friend set us up but he said i knew i was in love with you when you said you like naomi russell on red scare because that's my favorite porn star too wow and i was match made in hell and i was like you're lying you're making this up because you want to ingratiate with me and like yeah you're trying to like pull one over but like he's right that's his you know whatever poison of choice and like that's probably crazy and unhealthy to have that kind of sell like knowledge of another person before you even meet them on some level yeah well then where i'm fucked because yeah <laughs> there's hundreds of hours of me <laughs> like listing your sexual yeah. <laughs> people have a lot of in- intel out there yeah. the dossier is getting pretty long yeah <laughs> an excel spreadsheet like a shitty medium men list of all the ways that you like being abused right but um, nowadays you can find like there's sort of porn has created like a culture that's coincided with like hookup culture whatever you want to call it you can meet a relative stranger Mm -hmm. on an app or what have you and like have degrading can very conventional sex with them it's like it's no longer niche i think Mm -hmm. wait what do you mean when you say degrading conventional sex like uh that like degrading sex has become conventional oh yeah it's become the norm so normies are now practicing yeah. The sex that was previously rather countercultural. And I think that a lot of women and men probably too aren't enjoying it. You know? Because like being, people don't understand what their desires are because we've been inundated with pornography. So you think like that you're consenting to a sexual encounter that I think ultimately is not that fulfilling for people because they are kind of like 
playing out a script of what they think yeah, sex like is. pre-scripted. And, and they're not honest with themselves about what it is that they actually want. Well, and also all of these kind of like risque acts and moves are only really erotic and exciting if you have kind of the underlying jouissance to carry them out. If you have yeah. like a personal um uh, let's say uh sympathy or affinity or chemistry right and i feel like a lot of people a lot of young people who have literally no social chemistry are meeting up colliding against each other like bubbles and then disappearing right having very sex that's very like dissociated Mm -hmm. from themselves and their partners and their desires yeah (laughs) um ban porn so the other piece that we read was in the new york times this really contributed to my my birthday depression by the way um and it was uh an article called Uh, unmarried like happily ever after or something it was about how an increasing number of women are choosing single life over married life yeah though choosing is they're coping by pretending like they're choosing they're coping with being alone by pretending like it's an empowering choice that they've made right and that's evident in this entire article where women say things like finding what makes you happy is the most important thing wrong again (laughs) wrong 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 no finding what makes you happy is the (laughs) low on the totem pole and really you should be um practicing self-sacrifice yeah Um, when you're feeling someone out and starting to spend the night together, you don't sleep well. She said a few years ago, I would have been like, of course, sleep over. No big deal. Now she chooses to work out in the morning, make breakfast or sleep in if she so desires. She prefers to wake up alone. (laughs) (laughs) This is another one. Plus screaming in her twin size bed. No, that's me. Sorry. Yeah. I don't let my lovers spend the night because I wake up screaming. (laughs) Because you have to like spoon each other. The well, danger, my bed's very small. It's tiny. The danger of being a slender person is that, like, you and another <laughs> slender person can, in fact, share a twin bed, but it's really uncomfortable. Ill-advised. You can't be like a three hundred pound man up in there. But no, but these chicks are lying to themselves. They are. It's crazy. This is another one plucked from the playbook of like stating the obvious. More than seven months after her split, split, Miss Claire has settled into her new life where she now enjoys yoga classes, seeing friends, or staying in on a Friday night watching the series Outlander rather than going out on dates. Oof. She also cherishes her sleep. Come on. Uh, literally. Does, does, does it really need to be said that there are many perks to being single <laughs> and solitary, just like there are many perks to being <laughs> coupled up? I mean, it does if you you... I mean, you have to articulate them to convince yourself that it's um, virtuous. If you've be built like, your entire life around the expectation that you would be married and have children. Mm-hmm. You see, I never and had that expectation. You say, so. At least I can watch Outlander. <laughs> At least I could binge FX shows Ooh. while getting Postmates. Grim stuff. It's really sad for it's like encountering again like a a, a woman fe- uh, Uber driver. It's sadder than seeing the same thing. It's, for some reason, men have a better, uh, higher, kind of better constitution for for being alone, for solitude and anger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is it about women, lonely women, that's more pathetic? <laughs> well, it, because we're they ought not to be. Well, because um, whereas men, you can be like, yeah, you deserve it. I, well, because the cultural kind of ethos downplays the level to which women, even like professional self-actualized women like us, are slaves to our biology. Yeah. Um, Paglia quotes had a great um, quote to that effect Lay it today. On me. Um, fertility is the missing chapter in sex education. Sobering facts about women's declining fertility after their 20s are being withheld from ambitious young women who are propelled along a career track devised for men. This is from Free Women, Free Men, 2017. Wow. Well, I mean, to that, I'd say, you know, there are a bit... um, a myriad of, like, in vitro options now. Well, now, and now you see women, like, increasingly having kids at, like, 45 46 50 50. i used to work for a woman who had twins at 50 which is which is crazy insane 
Because she worked her whole life to become like a professor and a lawyer and stuff. Yeah. And then at 50 decided that she wanted kids. Yeah. And there's something kind of pathological about that. I hate to say it, but okay. Never mind the front end risks, i.e. having a child that is developmentally disabled because you waited too long or yeah or bringing kind of serious medical risks upon yourself because Mm -hmm. you you were too old to have a kid healthily have a child um there is the back end risk of the fact that you're going to be 72 and seeing your kids off to college yeah that's crazy i know i mean yeah you don't want that who knows what you're going to feel like when you're 72 well, you, you clearly you didn't know what you were going to feel like when you were 50 when you decided that you... Yeah, no, it's like really wild. Um, so this article I thought was like, okay, fairly self-explanatory. Good companion to the to the Pornhub one. Yeah, it was fine up until kind of the first half. They talked about like Emma Watson calling herself self-partnered. How convenient that a pretty young 29-year-old actress is self-partnered. <laughs> she can probably find a husband and get married in the next few years, which is probably what she's going to like do. me i am also a 29 year old <laughs> self-partnered actress <Yeah. laughs> very inspiring stuff but it's like i'm not worried about emma watson i'm not worried about you either i'm worried about the you're hordes not, of, you're not worried about me. well not in the way that i'm worried about the hordes of 48 year old professional women who are waking up in their twin beds shrieking <laughs> you know if they have queen size beds they can afford yeah they, they probably do it. And like, I can, yeah, I can, I have a very distinct mental image of these women's apartments. Yeah, me too. You know, lots of knickknacks, knickknacks and plants and like just cat cuddling up with a bottle of wine and lots of your, um, your programs. I'd rather live like a dog in Chinatown with Kyle. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, lots, but there's like lots of knickknacks that simulate um, warmth that exude an atmosphere of abundanza because Mm -hmm. the kind of like inner reality is fairly barren um there's this woman that they profile who has a a popular instagram account where she takes um photos of her left hand sends a engagement ring yeah um and then she also has she she made a website called the knot where she no the knot is a website for people to re- um, register their weddings. Oh, okay. But she made a she registered her like wedding, wedding to, herself. to herself. Auto lesbianism. This is an example of someone who has way too much time because no one loves that. <laughs> I know, I know. And I'm like, I was thinking like, for a person who's so proud to be like unmarried, you sure spend a lot of time thinking about marriage and weddings, Literally staring at your bare left hand <laughs> yeah. and putting it online yeah it's what do you think is gonna yeah why would you triple down on something like that you know i know and she says like well, why I'm would you make that your brand why would you make being alone your brand i know that's so weird she, and she's she says well you know i don't resent anybody who's uh, in a couple or engaged or married but that's like, fuck you <laughs> fuck you Ugh. it's fine it's fine i like being alone <laughs> i like it <laughs> tears streaming down my face <laughs> i don't why would Turning i want to blue why would i want a boyfriend <laughs> it, it's well, it's so depressing and like she wait i'm like reading this now um yeah she she um in uh-huh. addition i'm gonna read this because it's so it. depressing and i'm really trying to kill time um we're it, we're like almost at an hour so. woo. Mm. um in addition to the instagram page miss mccarthy created a fake wedding website via the knot where she details her relationship with herself and tacos and requests actress Anne hathaway to attend an imaginary december 31st 2022 wedding as her flower girl for context banana bread is the bridesmaid and tv is the matron of honor mm. Uh, she sounds fat to to date more than 250 people electronically submitted rsvps to the non-existent party oh my god i would say it's a brilliant work of conceptual conceptual art if it wasn't so pathetic and depressing though maybe that's the point (laughs) it's very tv the role that like tv plays in this self-partnered advocacy article and eating and drinking couldn't glasses be. upon glasses of wine. Couldn't be me. I like 
solitude me too it's an integral part of of anybody's humanity and like even if you are in a couple you should spend you should make sure to carve out patches of solitude for yourself without saying yeah but you you know it shouldn't be your life purpose to find a partner but you can't prioritize yourself at the (laughs) at the jeopardy of everything else that's no way to live it ain't right yeah (laughs) That's the, well, that's the whole problem. It's like they have this. Um, what was the thing that they said um, that was like really alarming? Um, Dr. Manley, that's a funny name, <laughs> says that for centuries, uh, men and particularly women were raised to believe that they are more valuable when they're married. You are. You, you are. simply are. Not because you had a wedding or you're with another person but because you have become a procreative unit yes you're literally more valuable to future stock someone else is invested in a like mutual partnership with you yeah that is like by definition value yeah and it's like a really scary i mean interest and investment yeah and that's why it's scary. I mean, this is a scary. You think you're more valuable than me because you have a kid who depends on you, who Sorry. <laughs> values you. Sorry. <laughs> um, this concept remains prevalent despite people having a more relaxed attitude about marriage. In the 2012 General Society Surve- survey, more than half of adult Americans reported that getting married is not an experience they consider important to becoming an adult. Well, guess what it is. That's why you're all fucking stupid little babies. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you are stuck in a state of arrested development because you can't get over yourself and who take, sublimate your will to someone else. I know, who like take pictures of like food at restaurants and like. Oh, I'm depressed. I know. It's like really depressing. Well, you have nothing to be worried about. You don't know that. I could end up alone. <laughs> well, anybody could, hypothetically. <laughs> yeah. But you're but basically I probably won't. Yeah, you probably won't. You're basically I mean, you might end up divorced, which is like no way to guard against that. Yeah, which is like not so bad. I'm a big proponent of divorce in general, because, again, it means that women have live in a society where they have um, social and financial mobility, which right. is a good sign. Right. Um, and sometimes things don't work out. I mean, look, basically one way or another, your relationship will come to an end. Amen. Best case scenario is that somebody dies before the other person, even, which is about as bad as it gets. Even the best relationship in my life, this one. <laughs> <laughs> even this pod will end one day. On that note. One, one day. The, the Well, on that note, um, I should happy say birthday. happy birthday to you, Dasha. I truly love and adore you. Love you too. And um this is is probably like self-interested and narcissistic but like i feel like i would have gotten along with you no matter who you were but the fact that you're russian means a lot to me same because it confirms my suspicions of our spiritual supremacy amen yeah see you in hell yeah see you in hell (laughs)